start that finally? It's on. Oh. Yeah, see, Dave, you don't. Oh, yeah, it says it's going live. Celebrated, and yet 
we still know um, that we are going to remember the story of Christ's resurrection today and the joy and the hope that brings. And when we return back together again, we will celebrate Easter a second time. We'll do a giant celebration whenever we are able to return together in person and have a chance to gather and celebrate once again the hope that Christ continues to bring us, even in the most difficult of circumstances. Before we begin worship, we have a couple of announcements we want to share. Um, first, I know this might seem irrelevant, but the church office will be closed on Monday after Easter. Um, obviously, it's physically been closed, but we're actually going to ask that um, our staff take the day off because we've been doing a lot in preparation for Easter and um, for all of the stuff going on at this time during Holy Week. And so tomorrow, um, nobody will be able to answer the phones because um, we're going to ask Kathy and everybody to take a day of rest uh, and celebration and recovery. The second announcement is, um, if you haven't checked out the uh, website recently, please do that. On the website, we have um, a lot of new uh, resources available for people, and especially in family ministries. Angie Royal, who is our Director of Family Ministries, she has a bunch of activities, a bunch of age range sort of um, opportunities for folks to engage with their faith at home with the kids. Uh, she also has a really cool new project she's been working on called Honey Bunnies. Uh, this is a thing she's been dreaming up for a really long time. And what it is is actually a way um, for folks to use art skills and process art um, to not only um, connect with themselves and with God, but also to serve their community. So please check that out on the website. Um, it's really incredible what she's been working on. Friends, as we turn our hearts and minds to worshiping the risen Christ, I pray that wherever you are, wherever you find yourself today, that the presence of God is palpable in your midst. Join us as we pray. Holy God, we come to you this morning with a mix of all sorts of emotions. As we gather on our couches and in our living rooms, as we gather with our loved ones, as we gather and comment and share and connect with one another, Lord, we confess that especially today we need the hope of your new life. We need the joy to look forward to. We need the promise that resurrection will always have the last word. God, as we worship together today, we pray that you would turn our hearts and minds toward you. We pray that the Holy Spirit would be in our midst, that we would know, Lord, not only your love and your mercy, but your power and your hope. God, we invite you into our space of worship, and we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand in your living rooms or wherever you are, if you're able, and join us as we sing hymn 302, Christ the Lord is risen today. If you don't have the lyrics, Google them real quick. Christ the Lord is risen today. We'll do the first four verses.
turn the bulletin, if you have the bulletin at home, um, we have one change. We've actually reversed the scriptures. So first, today, we're, we're going to read the book of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 31. <laughs> Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over. He looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was him. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers, and you tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when he came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have
Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have our God in prayer, remembering those uh, on our hearts and minds that they can't be with us, that we can't gather together, uh, but we remember them in our hearts. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we remember with joy the story we just heard in Scripture, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus is alive, that hope lives today. God, we come to you with the great joys of our hearts, but Lord, like Mary, some of us still stand weeping. We still grieve those things, and there's some sense of loss. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that. And we bring that to you in prayer. And Lord, we simply ask that you would walk with us as you did with the disciples, that you would walk with us as you did with Mary, that you would walk with us as you have done so faithfully throughout all time. God, meet us where we are and hear these prayers. Lord, we pray for those who are sick, those who are in need of healing. God, healing emotionally, physically, spiritually, or otherwise. God, we pray for those who are recovering from surgery, those anticipating treatment. God, those who need a dose of your healing spirit. Lord, we pray for those who need healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we bring these joys and these celebrations to you on a day that feels um, hopeful, on a day that feels, as we just heard again in John, this idea of celebration and joy that Jesus is alive. God, we bring these other joys to you, knowing that you have healed, you have answered prayer, you have given us so much to be thankful and grateful for. And so, Lord, we offer these prayers of thanksgiving and, and celebration to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, on a day that is so often marked by joining together with family and friends, Lord, we acknowledge that many of us can't do that today. And Lord, we acknowledge in that same spirit those who can't do that often. Lord, we pray for those who are lonely today. Those who can't see or talk or experience presence with the people that they love. God, we pray for those who are homebound. We pray for those who are in incarceration. In incarceration. We pray for those in foster care. We pray for those in any circumstance that are lonely or isolated from the people that they love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we remember the events of this week as we celebrated Holy Week. Remember the Last Supper, Lord, when Jesus died with those who he knew would betray him, knew would let him down, knew would cause him harm. And Lord, in that same spirit, in that same vein, we pray for our enemies, not because it's easy, it's not. But, God, but because, God, you are our model. You are our example, and we do, we seek to do as you do. So, Lord, we pray now for our enemies those who have caused us harm and those who we have harmed ourselves. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we offer all other prayer requests to you at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, 
we offer these prayers to you, knowing that you are faithful, knowing that you are good, and knowing that in you, new life is possible. In those places that feel like death, God, in those places where it feels like all hope is lost, meet us there. Speak our name softly as you did to Mary on that Easter morning. And God, meet us in those places that we would rather lock you out of like you did to the disciples. God, in all of those places, we ask that you simply meet us where we are and walk with us every step of the way. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, now I'll uh, transition into a time of offering just a word of reminder. Um, if you feel so inclined to give online, you can do so through our website, fumcsanford.org slash giving. Uh, many of you have done that faithfully and been really overwhelmed with the response. Um, though it looks different here, um, the, the, the faithfulness of those who are, who are giving. And those who have dropped off checks and mailed them as well, thank you for that. But, but now as we enter a time of offering and giving our blessings back to God, uh, we acknowledge that God is good all the time and all the time. God is good.
Lord, we pray that you would bless all the gifts that we give, the gifts of our hands and our heart and our minds. We pray that you would multiply those gifts, not only, Lord, for the service in the church, but as a gift to the whole world. All this we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now let's sing that old gospel hymn, He Lives, all three verses, hymn 310, He Lives. second reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the providence of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how, good, how God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people 
and testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living of the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through the power of his name. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in our gospel account, uh, the gospel of John, we, we meet a lot of different characters, and all of those characters seem to react to crisis, as Megan has mentioned, in very different ways. Um, slow to warm up, quick to believe, and everything in between. We hear first of, well not first, we hear of Mary Magdalene first, but Megan will talk about that in a second, but we hear of these two disciples uh, that have a foot race to the tomb once they hear that there's a possibility that Jesus might be alive. And we encounter these two characters, and one is named Peter, and one is not named. It's just the beloved disciple. And while the writer of John doesn't take the time to clarify who that is, he's very explicit to say that he's a very fast runner, um, which I think is very odd. He beat Peter to the tomb and he says that twice, uh, just to make set the record straight. Um, there's a lot of different theories about who this person was. Uh, the top two are probably either James, the, the brother of Jesus, or John. And I'm going to invite us to imagine that it's John today. Uh, it doesn't necessarily actually matter who it is specifically, just the fact that this person, you hear about this person, they run as quickly as they can to the grave, and they get there and they immediately stop. And they don't go in. There's this moment of, you can almost read in, in the scripture, there's a moment of, of terror, of, of fear, of hesitation. They got there first, but they weren't quite ready to go inside. Uh, Peter goes in first, but this person kind of hangs back at first, not quite sure what to do. Uh, 
uh, and then and then when they finally take the, the courage to step into the tomb, the scripture is very quick about what happens with them. It says, he saw and he believed. Period. <laughs> That's it. All this person needed was to see the empty grave clothes, and he knew immediately what was happening. Now, Peter is a very different story. Um, and, you know, maybe it's because he's a slow runner. I don't know. Um, but, the, but the writer is very clear about that. Um, but so Peter arrives second, and he, but then he does something different. He goes straight into the tomb. No hesitation whatsoever. He walks around. He looks at the head covering. He looks at the linens that are there on the ground. And then he does something as well, very quickly. He leaves. We're not really told exactly what Peter is thinking or feeling in that moment, but he needed some more evidence. He, he wasn't quite sure to make an opinion just yet. And so we have these two disciples that react very differently at first, but uh, if you go on in the book of John or in that chapter, it says later that day they were all gathered, except for Thomas. They were all gathered in the upper room, locked behind closed doors out of fear of the Jews. Jesus had upset the powers that be, and so people were after his followers as well. And so these men were rightfully afraid, and John was there, and Peter was there, and there was a whole host of anxiety in that room, for sure. These men were trying to make sense of what was happening all around them, and they were still trying to grieve the loss of their leader and their friend. And so we can say with great certainty that in that room there was a lot of emotions. There was a lot of feelings. These disciples were absolutely full of anxiety and of doubt, and they were full of fear, fear about what would happen next, and fear about where Jesus had gone and when they, uh, what would happen to them in the coming days. Now, this is probably not a surprise, but my favorite reaction is Mary's. Um, Mary is also in crisis mode, and she is seems to be an overfunctioner. So not only um, does she get up when it's still dark outside, right? When While it was still dark, she goes to the tomb. She is going to fix, handle, uh, manage, do whatever it is that she's got to do. Um, she shows up, and she sees that Jesus' body isn't there. Now, I, my favorite line from today's reading was what she says to the gardener, who turns out to be Jesus. She's looking around, and she's like, someone has taken this body. So whatever it is, somebody has taken this body from the tomb, and this is our Lord who we love. And so um, Mary shows up, and she sees these angels who are sitting there, and they ask her, uh, woman, why are you weeping? Now, I, I really think that we might have misheard this for a lot of years. The angels and Jesus both say to Mary, woman, why are you weeping? I think probably the way we've been told to hear that is, woman, why are you weeping? Like, you're an idiot, don't you know? Or like, get yourself together, that's a little too much feelings. But in fact, I think that these angels and Jesus have this compassionate Ask of Mary, tell me the weight that is weighing you down. Tell me the story of your tears. Why are you weeping? Now, this is the response I love for Mary. She says to the gardener, Jesus, look, if you've taken the body, just tell me where it is so I can go get it, right? I love that because she's like, yeah, yeah, I'll work it through my feelings. Here's the thing. Do you have the body? Do you have the body? Because I'm going to handle it. She's rightfully tired, and she's heartbroken, and she's the one who's going to get this done. I hear in her that she's a little bit fed up. I love Mary's response because I think it's so honest. I think in crisis, a lot of us can be the sort of people who are like, get out of the way, everybody just move, I'm going to take care of this thing, we're going to do this, everybody, I'll handle it myself. I think Mary finds herself in disbelief and heartbroken, trying to figure out her best way forward. And then Thomas. So this was a really long reading. Thank you for sticking with us for 31 verses. Um, but we also hear about Thomas. Now, um, Thomas, who's often called Doubting Thomas, it really stinks that he gets that title because lots of people doubt, but poor dude is often called Doubting Thomas. 
He is also rightfully defensive and scared, and he didn't just need to see Jesus' wounds. He didn't need to just encounter Jesus in the upper room like the other disciples did. He didn't need to just lay his eyes on the risen Lord. Thomas is like, you know what? I've been burned by hope before. Don't show up with your pretty pictures and whitewash this story. I just can't handle it. I don't want to hear you tell me good news that later on is going to be bad news. Thomas says, I don't need to just see those wounds. I need to touch them. Maybe you know what this feels like. Being so let down by hope time after time that you've really got to be sure this time. Maybe not even the folks closest to you will convince you because maybe they're naive too. Maybe they haven't been burned by hope enough. Maybe you, with Thomas, need to not only see Jesus' wounds, but touch them. I think it's really important to note that Thomas recognizes Jesus by the way that he has been wounded and harmed. Thomas doesn't want to just see a hologram of Jesus or some kind of beautiful painted picture. Thomas knows that the real Jesus is a God who has been through suffering and death and pain and torture and betrayal by his friends and by the powers that be. Thomas knows that the real story is not hopeful unless those wounds are real. You see, Jesus meets each of these folks, John, Peter, Mary, Thomas, exactly where they are. After all, they're in a terrible moment of disorientation and hurt and pain. Jesus doesn't show up to them and say, all y'all get it together. Do you notice he says to the disciples over and over, peace be with you. Jesus meets them where they are, hears their tears, shows his wounds, speaks a word of peace. He shows up to them in lots of different times and places. You see, John only needed to see the pile of, gra of grave clothes. I imagine what was it like for Jesus to peel away every layer of the grave clothes that had been wrapped around his body. For Peter, he needed to see not only the empty tomb, but the risen Lord. For Mary, she needed to hear Jesus say her name. Did you notice when Jesus says, Mary, that's when she recognizes this is the Lord. And for Thomas, he needed to touch the wounds. Wherever you are today, we pray that, like these disciples, that the resurrected Jesus can show up in these scriptures and in our time and in our midst in whatever way we need. When Jesus shows up to these folks, he, he does so without judgment. He shows up and says peace to the disciples. He meets the folks where they are, but he shows up and he doesn't just give these folks a greeting. He gives them a mission. See, Jesus shows up to these folks exactly how they are, and he meets them where they are, and then he sends them out. Jesus didn't want to just show up and hang out with his friends again and, and have another party or extend the, the last supper just another day. No, Jesus comes with a very specific greeting, and here it is again from Scripture. He says, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. What Jesus is doing in this moment in John, and what Jesus is doing in this moment for all of us, is inviting us into the work that God is doing. Not only is death the end, but now the disciples have a calling. Not only is Jesus' mission to love those who... Uh, who have felt outcast to bring liberty to the oppressed and recovery of sight to the blind and declare the year of the Lord's forgiveness. Not only is that Jesus' work, but now God and through Jesus has invited the disciples in and God has invited us into that work too. And see, this is what's really fascinating about this. The, the second reading we did was, was Peter's, one of Peter's famous, famous speeches in the book of Acts. And what Peter is declaring is that he now sees. Now you think, I mean, he was there. He, he saw the empty grave. He saw the resurrected Lord. And it's almost it took until Acts chapter 10, several chapters later, 
for him to kind of say, I get it. I finally see what God is doing. I finally see that God is showing no favoritism, that God is actually available to all people. God shows up not only for me, but for every single person. See, Peter had the privileged perspective of this idea that he saw God do the unbelievable. He, was, he bore witness to the fact that the tomb was empty and that Jesus walked among, um, among him and his friends. But he also saw that God was doing some other unbelievable things uh, in the people of Israel, in the people through Jerusalem at, at Pentecost that we'll celebrate in just a few uh, weeks. He continually saw that God was doing amazing things, and he couldn't help but going out and, and telling that to the people that he encountered, indeed, to all people that he encountered. And friends... This is really our calling as an Easter people. To show up exactly as we are and to have Jesus meet us there. And then. And it's a really important and then. And then when we encounter Jesus as the resurrected Lord, to not only receive the peace and comfort that he offers, but also to receive the mission. To also receive the sending. As the Father sent Jesus, so God sends us to practice resurrection all around us, right? To see hope in the darkest places, to believe that new life and new possibilities are possible. We are called to believe that death is not the final word, and we hold fast to the notion that no matter how dark it seems, even in the darkness of the tomb, even in the darkness of death, that God has been there. God is with us there now, and God will continue to be with us always. As Easter people, we hold fast to this kind of silly concept called hope. The idea that as bad as it gets, as heavy as it feels, that there is nothing, friends, nothing, not even death, that can separate us from the love of God. This is the beauty of the Easter morning. This is the beauty of the Easter story. This is the power of the resurrection, that when it all seems over, that love and hope get the final word. So our invitation to you today is to see and encounter the risen Lord. To take with you the words that you need to hear from Jesus. Maybe it's Jesus speaking, peace be with you. Maybe it's Jesus just saying your name. Maybe it's Jesus reaching out his hand, showing you that he has been wounded too. Or maybe it's just the image of the grave clothes, carefully wrapped up and left in the tomb. Whatever it is, hear God loving you and speaking to you today, right where you are. A resurrected God who ended Hours of death. And then remember that when you receive the good news, the hope, the peace, the healing and the liberation that God offers, know that your mission is to share it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In, In the name of the Father, the, the, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because he lives, we'll sing the first and the final verse.
celebrate that the hope of the resurrection is always present. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore.